Welcome to Sunday Scriptures for Patriots. I'm here with Barry DeMoz. My name is Sean Morgan, and uh, we had a little break. Uh, Barry was feeling a little ill, but we're, we're back, and we're going to keep on going for our Sunday episodes. Uh, we've been talking about masculine Christianity. We've been talking about the history of feminism and uh, how to be true representatives of Christ's kingdom government as heads of household, how important the family is for all of that, and how the communists and the satanic agenda was to subvert the family structure and God's design. We're going to go to a quick word from our sponsor who helps us and supports our ministry. So you can support them as well. And uh, when we get back, we're going to dig into this topic. Gold is near all time highs. Has it reached its peak? Did you miss the boat? No, I don't think so. The exploding debt, change in the interest rate cycle, political and economic turmoil have caused the current move in gold. And those things are getting worse. In fact, Citibank projected gold to hit $3,000 an ounce over the next 12 to 18 months. I encourage you to protect and grow your investment portfolio with gold. I trust Dr. Kirk Elliott with Sovereign Advisors. With over 25 years of experience and two PhDs, Kirk Elliott is the best of the best in the industry. Call his office at 720-605-3900 and tell him Sean Morgan sent you, or just click on the link in the description to get that free consultation. All right, Barry. So what did you feel that we weren't able to cover uh, enough when we were talking about the history of feminism? Mm -hmm. Well, just, yeah, to kind of bring things back up to speed, uh, there's what's considered this first wave feminism that came into America between roughly 1830 and 1920. And it's represented represented by three uh, clear attacks to uh, men governing and their masculinity. And one of them that we did deal with fairly well last time was about alcohol, okay? And so the movement to uh, the temperance movement and to outlaw the, um, the sale and production and consumption of you know alcohol. And we did cover that. I just thought that um, I'd bring another little small piece to that equation because I was sick recently it occurred to me when I'm laying in bed half dying that um, the scripture that uh, we find in first Timothy 523 where Paul says to Timothy Dr- no longer drink water but drink wine for your stomach state okay and that came up to me to where you know what I need, that's what I need right now. I'm, in addition to all the oranges I was eating, getting a lot of citrus in me, I thought I need some red wine. Okay. And so um, uh, I endeavored to go get some. And lo and behold, um, a major grocery store chain here in Pennsylvania, Wegmans, uh, they wouldn't sell it to me when they, because they asked me for identification. And I didn't have it on me. I was sick. I'm not even thinking right. I actually got the wherewithal to get out there and and get uh, some wine. But I had two of my children with me, Sean. And here in Pennsylvania, I was just uh, a freshly disgusted with the fact that, um, you know, I don't look like I'm old enough to drink alcohol. (laughs) And that's it's just a bureaucratic um, thing that they do at Wegmans. Yeah. They have a hundred percent ID everyone policy, uh, and they don't like. It doesn't matter if you're 99 years old and you're hunched over in a wheelchair or whatever. Uh, they will not sell you alcohol there. And this is this is mm-hmm. the this is the satanic system because Barry, you're the one who taught me that when they try to put on these extra burdens, that's a surefire mm-hmm. sign that it's a satanic uh, stronghold. It is, Sean. And you know what? I spoke with um, the manager that was there at the time, and he has a mask on. And uh, okay, that's fine. He got a mask on. But I I, I just engaged him on the futility of this and that, uh, you know, we can't stand in front of one another and do good for one another. You've got a product I want. I've got the money here to buy it. And you're being told by complete strangers at, uh, through a law at the legislature, uh, put in a law, like you said, that um, they card everybody regardless. 
And it really ticked me off. I, I just preached to him. I told him what's good about America and that this is communistic. This is um, keeps people immature, Sean, when before anything goes wrong, we've got a law that says you can't do this activity. You can't have this transaction. And it really moved on me. It ticked me off. I even went to uh, somebody who was um, uh, in, the, in the aisle there uh, looking at wine and whatnot. And I asked her if she would get it for me. And uh, she wasn't willing to do it. She said, oh, I'm sorry. And all this kind of thing. And so see, that's this whole social distancing, whatnot. People are fearful to help your neighbor. Okay. Right. And this is totally a biblical thing that's going on, a phenomenon, this attack that we can't do good for one another. And um, uh, so <clears throat> uh, I have it in me. I, I'd like to go to Harrisburg, the Capitol, and, and uh, find out what it would take to go in front of those knucklehead politicians and make the case about how they are keeping the people of this state immature, because that's what it does when you have a law that prevents yeah. you from doing uh, you're right barry it is so communist uh, i have a lot of experience <laughs> traveling in former communist ussr states like ukraine and um i live in brazil which is a socialist country and what what this socialism and communism does is it gives a lot of power to petty bureaucrats to be able to wield power over your daily life instead mm -hmm. of giving the power to the individuals to the citizens it gives the power to these basically pen pencil pushers who, who yeah. bean counters, these different people who they don't really think they just really get a power trip. And so, yeah, it'll be one little cashier that makes minimum wage that'll be able to control whether you can get medicine or not. <laughs> so it's just putting the power in the wrong place. We need to teach autonomy. You know, we need to teach autonomy to our children uh, because the, the founding fathers of America founded this country on the basis that we can handle the responsibility of sovereignty. It's not, the sovereignty is not just for the elite, it's for everyone. And so uh, we need to live up to that, we need to teach it. And that's why, Barry, that's probably part of the reason why you homeschool your kids because you send them yeah. to the government training centers and they, they lose their autonomy. Uh, so, but let's get back to the, the history of feminism because I think there are some things that you wanted to cover that you weren't able to last time. Yeah. Uh, well, let's go to the next uh, next area of attack by feminism, which um, I like to call contentious against rest restitution. Okay. And uh, what that is about is uh, women getting upset about uh, slavery and a certain form of slavery, which uh, <clears throat> that would be what you call chattel slavery of bringing people over to this country from other countries abducting them like in say africa and uh bringing them over here just for the sake of a market right the slave trade and the slave market okay now that is wrong that you can't make an excuse for that and and actually um people to do just justice to history you have to go back way farther actually go into the old testament and it was egyptians that's an african nation they were enslaving other nations like the hebrew people okay so it's good to just briefly make a point that uh slavery is not a white man's preoccupation it's a sin nature of any man to uh sure put people into bondage okay so um but here in america uh we have uh, there's another kind of slavery see that's uh, actually perfectly legitimate and it is biblical and it needs to be understood constitutional as, yes well thank you very much yes see people think that uh, slavery uh was outlawed as a result of the civil war well um, let's let's get a reality check here. I'm going to read right here, since you mentioned it, Sean, that um, the 13th Amendment to our Constitution says this, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude 
except as a punishment for a crime where the party shall have been duly convicted shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Okay, so slavery does not exist here except one condition, and that is when you've been committed, uh, convicted of a crime, you have to pay off that crime. And that's what, uh, that's a form of slavery, or it's called indentured servitude. Biblically, it's called restitution. You make the injured party whole, okay? And uh, <clears throat> you can look in the Old Testament in Exodus chapter 21 and 22. God's law there has very specific cases and situations about when somebody does X, here is the result. And usually it was a double uh, restitution. You had to pay back double of what you damaged or stole, okay? And so that's what justice is, is that um, you don't go to jail for stealing something. You actually, you restore the thing you stole. And then for the trouble, you do double. It's not enough just to pay it back, right? That that makes perfect sense to me. And, uh, you know, you got to work it off. <laughs> yeah, work it off. Um, and that's where jails, jailing, quite frankly, is foreign to a Christian nation and is really is foreign to um, our, 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 the early days of our country. J jails are um, for violent uh, situations where there's going to be a trial, okay? And, yeah, uh, just trying to see... keep the violent people away from everybody else to keep everybody safe. Yeah, so, and, but we know there, uh, Sean, there is all kinds of nonviolent uh, activity in which men and sadly even women are in prison. I said jail. Jails are kind of short term. Prison um, is like for longer than a year, uh, is what I understand. And so the whole you know prison population uh, problem of not enough beds and all that kind yeah. of thing. Uh, it's and we have the opposite problem too, where there are <clears throat> violent criminals. I, I re read a shocking uh, headline yesterday that a man uh, shot his girlfriend and killed her, uh, but he shot her 22 times just to show you how violent this guy is. And he's out on bail right now. So the very thing that jail and prison are, are meant for, to keep society safe from violent criminals, we're not using them for that. We're using them to warehouse nonviolent people as some kind of backward, just basically profit for the pr private prison system instead of uh, true justice and true restitution. Well, Sean, um, that's how far we are as a nation off of a standard that never changes, and that is the scriptures. This is called Sunday Scriptures for Patriots. This is what we want to cultivate in our own thinking and with our listening audience is if you're going to reject the law of God, what do you have? that you can bank on to your last breath that will never change you see man doesn't that's not capable man is not capable of uh not changing man is very fickle and god is holy other than that he is the lord thy god i change not he says and so what more uh foundation could you want there is no other foundation than as the scripture says, Christ Jesus, the firm foundation. He is the rock, and his word is a rock of revelation. Revelation knowledge is what the Bible is, okay? We have natural knowledge, the laws of nature. Our Declaration of 76 uh, references that, but then it also references the second law, the second body of law, and that's the laws of nature's God, which is written in the revelation of scripture. Okay, we need revealed law. We need the mind of God to tell us how to deal with mankind, how to just have order and liberty and peace, okay? And so uh, we're, this is just a clear area where we are in judgment, this excessive jailing and imprisoning people when uh, the injured, the, the, the true victims are not being made whole. You see, and in the state, 
it's become to a place where it believes it's the victim, right? With all these manufactured uh, crimes, it has become the victim. But that is that is contrary to our way of life, our, to our common law way of life. The state can never be the victim. So let's let's think on that and 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 let's be moved to talk to say our sheriff. Okay, educate him as to uh, the state can never really be the victim. Does that make sense? That makes intuitive sense. Uh, yeah. That some kind of big <clears throat> government with unlimited resources uh, yeah. just always seems to be this party that's going against the little guy. And then the people who are supposed to be objective referees, the judges, are employed by the very system that are claiming to be injured parties. It's totally rigged against us. And all of the police officers uh, who act as witnesses, they're all paid by the same government. They all know each other. They know all the judges. So when you go into that jurisdiction or when you go into that uh, court system, mm -hmm. Everything is rigged against you because you are all these government agents versus you. <laughs> so uh, it just goes yes. to show, Barry, how much we need to get together, <clears throat> yes. have fellowship with fellow Christians, fellow citizens, so that we can pool our collective power together. You know, instead of just being these lone rangers trying to fight City Hall by ourselves, yes, uh, we we have a lot more influence, a lot more power. If we know the uh, police officers, if we know the politicians, if we know the judges, if we, if we volunteer in our community, if we contribute to our community, and, and uh, the, when we go in there, we won't be uh, some kind of just fanatic or some kind of uh, um, s someone acting solo. It's way, way more right. yeah. effective to be a com engaged community member uh, than to be a, uh, a random guy. So Sean, let, let, let me, let me, uh, let me unpack that a little bit since you mentioned that. I, I want to say something now that I wasn't planning on, but since with that comment, um, let me just put out a little um, blurb, an advertisement, if you will, of what I am personally beginning to do here in Pennsylvania. And then specifically, so what I'm going to, sh uh, <clears throat> this is going to apply to anybody who's, who wants to take action based on what you just said um, and, and, and assist them to do that. And um, what I, one of the things that I've been studying is the role of the sheriff and what's called the committees of safety. Okay. COS committees of safety. And what that is that in the time of our founding, we had men like Sam Adams. Sam Adams is considered the father of the American Revolution. He he was the great antagonistic there that uh, the British, uh, the the American uh, British colonists, uh, you know, they had rights as colonists. They had rights as Christians. They had rights as uh, uh, British subjects. Okay, and they were all they were being violated, and that's why the Declaration of seventy six was written. It's all these uh, violations to their common law biblical rights okay and what happens is that when the government fails to do its proper role to protect our life liberty and property that's really all they're to be doing when they exceed that authority now they're abusing they become abusive and so the people have to take their government back and the way they did that then was in the in the founding era is to form committees of core uh well committees of safety and then uh there was a sub committee of correspondence and so they wrote uh, throughout the colonies to unify the people okay and this is what uh, I'm doing with a few other people uh, is to start forming a committee of safety where we um, become committee men and jury administrators and informing the sheriff of his role, he is the highest constitutional officer at the county level. He's not beholden to the attorney general or the solicitor general like I've actually been on the phone uh, with this sheriff in Lancaster County. And so uh, I have resources and uh, resources with others that uh, we are gonna form a committee of safety in Lancaster County that's where I'm hoping to move. I'm in Cumberland right now, 
but uh, I'm, I'm looking to move to Lancaster for various uh, reasons. I'm not going to share right now, but um, uh, anybody who's listening, Sean, that uh, that may be in Lancaster County, I want them to get a hold of me if they want to act on what you said that we need to come together. And this is how we take our country back is at the county level. The strongholds are too big at the state and federal level. You, and that's not the way that God works. He works from the bottom up, starting with yourself. Okay, so um, we have a vehicle here of the Committee of Safety to uh, meet regularly, like once a month, educate the people and invite the sheriff and others. And we're, this is how we take our government back is at the county level with the Committee of Safety. And so- uh, and, and just imagine yeah. how much more yeah. effective you will be if you go into a court and to your part of a committee of safety and you have a relationship with the sheriff. <laughs> yeah. That's, so that's, yes. that's great. Yeah. And uh, in fact, I stopped at the sheriff's office a couple of days ago. He wasn't there, but I left some paperwork, asked him to call me. And uh, that's what it looks like is rather than all the focus, you know, at the upper levels of people and, and bodies, uh, the kind of resources there, um, you can focus, we can focus on just one individual at the county level, that is the sheriff. And there's so much history where, uh, about the sheriff and his uh, posse comitas. You see, that's about the, um, the uh, you may, may have heard of the posse, but that's just men, able-bodied men who can come to the hue and the cry of the sheriff or actually the hue and the cry of anybody who sees a crime in the community, you put out the hue and the cry, uh, people are to respond, okay? And uh, that's just part of being a good Samaritan. That's part of loving your, your, your neighbor. And so that's the second great commandment. Love your neighbor, love your countrymen, come to their aid. Don't wait for the uniform guy. Come to just, the, the scripture says, uh, uh, don't consent to evil when you see it manifesting. Don't don't do something. Okay, so Sean, um, uh, this is I'm just drop that out there that to anybody in Pennsylvania uh, that wants to pursue these kind of things, the Committee of Safety uh, get a hold of me. But certainly, um, as I descend on Lancaster County, that's where I'm going to um, do some good things with my family and others to to um, start taking our government back and stop not just talk about it but we're going to do it absolutely and uh, because we're in a tyrannous time and in that time the government has demonstrated they are wholly uh incapable and in oh the word i want is incompetent they are incompetent sean and uh, that's at best what, incompetent at best infiltrated at worst Yes. Uh, so I agree with you. Bottom up, get involved. This is yes. what we talk about on uh, uh, the daily live program that I do on American Media Periscope. Mm -hmm. um, so is there something we didn't cover for the history of feminism that you want to make sure you get out in this episode? Sure. Yeah. There's um, <clears throat> uh, Before I transition to that, I want to make a, a recommendation for a film. Uh you see, uh, and this is getting about the slavery. We have an example in or in the earth where slavery was abolished and it was done properly. And that was done in England in the 1800s under primarily one individual, but he had his team. And that was William Wilberforce. Okay. See, slavery got abolished. The, the chattel, chattel like slavery got abolished. That's, this is the wrong idea of slavery. It got abolished in England without a war. Supposedly, you know, here we have this war, this civil war uh, uh, over it, but that's not true. That's, that's, um, uh, slavery was a pretext for the war. There was, it's over other uh, egregious things. But um, there's a beautiful film that shows wonderfully how uh, William Wilberforce, who became a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, and God moved on him about chattel slavery in England, and the film is titled Amazing Grace, okay? And uh, I just recommend people to watch that film and, uh, you know, have an entertaining uh, component of learning some history there on how uh, England 
was able to get rid of slavery without a war. And so the war that we had, uh, you know, that's a, that's a sad, that is a blot on our conscience as a nation, okay, that war. And we've not healed from that war, okay, uh, for those who, you know, know their history there. But um, <clears throat> so anyway, yes, so that's, you know, feminism uh, being contentious about slavery here in America, that it, that did not have to happen. That war did not have to happen. And uh, that's what happens when women uh, don't work with their men. They don't work for their fa- with their fathers or their husbands. They want to just get contentious and make things happen. And um, that's not the Lord. I mean, not, not to blame the Civil War completely on women, though, right? <laughs> um, just because, no. uh, from my understanding, there, there were a lot of wealthy slave owners, and there were a lot of people who want to do things their own way. And I don't even just blame the South. Uh, it's, people, historians are still arguing over what caused the Civil War. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, um, no, it's not that, uh, it's just that a handful of women, like, um, let's see, who is it? Susan B. Anthony, and uh, who was this other one here? I'm trying to see. Uh, Elizabeth Cady Staten. You know, they were fervent uh, in just, let's get the agitating things, okay? And of course, there was plenty of men involved. Uh, but here's the thing, yeah, there was, um, uh, men in the South, I mean, sorry, in the North that uh, agi- agitated, they, they were the abolitionists guys. And so rather than a peaceful elimination of this, which I referenced the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, which George Washington signed into law. And this was about settling territory in America, North and West of the Ohio River. In there, there is a provision that slavery will not exist in the United States, north and west of the Ohio River. And that was that became law in 1787. Okay, look, there was already uh, an effort. The founders did, you know, they couldn't deal with every nook and cranny of what they did to found this country, okay? But they were perfecting the slavery question. You know, uh, uh, they knew it was not the best to have here so we have evidence right there 1787 of that we're not going to have it north and west of the ohio river and see the way what you're pointing out but what you're pointing out uh with the slavery issue is it's very similar to the prohibition issue Mm. where not just women but uh definitely women uh decide to try to do something that maybe is doesn't need to be done in the agitation format Exactly. They ought to be working with their, their fathers and their husbands. They can appeal to conscience there and be uh, content, not contentious, but ladies, how about be content in the sphere of government that God has given you, okay? And that's to be the Christian daughter, the Christian wife, all right? So, Sean, let's, uh, let's with that segue, we can segue into this um, – third point of this wave of feminism in America, and that's about uh, content, being contentious, women being contentious against marital oneness. And this is about the vote, okay? Women's suffrage. Uh, we believe women are highly liberated because now they can vote, all right? And they've been able to do that since the early 1900s uh, legally, but in the 1800s, there was the women's suffrage movement, okay? And uh, so let's talk about that uh, for, for a bit because um, <clears throat> uh, what is that about? You know, that women can vote now where previously they did not, all right? Well, there was an understanding at that time that when a man voted, his vote was uh, representing the vote for his wife and the whole family. Okay. And it's called the governing principle. It was like a household vote. Yes, exactly. One household, not a divided household. See, now we have divided households because 
a wife can now vote independently and there and and separately from her husband if she has a contrary opinion and and basically cancel his his uh, civic responsibility and and uh, his civic decision for the household um john genesis chapter 2 verse 24 says that the man shall leave his husband i mean uh, leave his mother and father and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh so god in his mystery in his power he has a thing where he wants to make two become one all right like that boggles the natural mind all right but what that is at a minimum is a principle that you see all over scripture starting there in genesis 2 it's all over that we want to get clarity on because people are stumbling over this and that is the the governing principle of representation okay representation and so um the man represents the woman when they get married you notice that uh, she loses her family name or at least historically that's how it's always been all right she she drops the name of her father family and now she takes on the the family name of her own husband right but you know a lot of women don't do that anymore all right they retain and there's and there's always this spirit behind that right of they want to retain their own independent identity they're not comfortable to conform to the one flesh yeah and I, I like to say that I think in, in Christian churches, you know, uh, people are getting married and they're, you know, becoming the, the, the woman is losing her, uh, her own family's family name and identity and taking on her husband's. But uh, that's not always true. I, I do meet people who um, she has retained her, the, the family name that she grew up in. Okay. But um, that's not yielding that. I don't see that that's really, uh, the transfer of coming under out of the care from her father to her own husband. But that's what that's about. Okay. So that her, the woman's identity um, <clears throat> is, you know, always going to be under the protection of her man. First, her father, until such a time that she's going to be given over to her own husband. Okay. And comes under his protection. And so, uh, you know, he, the, the, the husband represents the wife when he votes and then the wife she equally well I wouldn't say necessarily equally she also represents her husband because she's taken on his name you see that sure it's that's how ag agency agency works right I mean you belong to the same family and not not necessarily in a legal <clears throat> sense but uh, in a reputational sense uh, your children represent your family. Your wife represents your family. You all have the same name. You all came from the same place. And uh, when one person's behavior can tarnish the reputation of the rest of the family. Exactly. Sean, um, I found some interesting articles that I'm going to make available uh, to this show. People can download. But I've got one here that was written in... I believe it was 1903. And the title of this is Why Women Do Not Wish the Suffrage. All right. Uh, this article is um, actually was printed, it was written in a, a paper. Uh, I want to say the Atlantic Monthly, something like that. But um, this is about a, a 10 page article. And <clears throat> I've read it twice now, and I'm probably going to read it again because I found it very encouraging as to uh, why it's not prudent for women to vote. And one of them is the fact that um, uh, it involves women to get involved in the civil uh, sphere and to be concerned about, you know, criminal activities. Let's just say, uh, you know, if they were to um, serve on a jury. Now they have to hear all of these um, details that um, women not, not be subject to hearing all these vile things that men are capable of doing. And sometimes, you know, even women uh, are, are capable of doing. But um, 
the the, the fact that um, women can vote and that gets them involved in the the science of government, okay, and that women can then run for office and take these positions of civil governing, what that puts on them is a duty now to rule over men, okay? And so we know from scripture that, uh, you know, men are to be ruling uh, certainly their homes and then out in society, representing their, their household interest in society, okay? Uh, but now if women can uh, hold positions of say policing and governing, now they're going to be commanding their fathers, their brothers, okay, other men. And so God didn't design women to command over men. But that's yeah, this is uh, this is very radical when you <clears throat> consider today's social norms. Mm -hmm. uh, for you to talk about this, I'm sure a lot of people who are hearing right now they're kind of like. What the heck? I've never even heard of the concept of women shouldn't be able to vote. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's interesting uh, because at the in, in times past, you know, 50, 100 years ago and previously, when women had, uh, you know, their jurisdiction was their house, household, they're taking care of their husband and their kids, it was somewhat preposterous and absurd for them to have so much civic responsibility. It's like, they don't even participate in the government. Why should they have to rule in the government space? They 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 take care of kids, you know, like that that was the the thought process back then. And now people's thought process is well, women are already in the corporate world, they're already in the civic world, they're already mayors and governors and all these things. So of course they should vote. Uh, they're already ruling over men. <laughs> so mm -hmm. so so it's you'd have to upend the entire status quo to reverse this type of trend, but that's, we're just going by the Bible. Like this is not like Sean's opinion, Barry's opinion. This is God's opinion. You know, this is God's design and we're just trying to live from it and understand it. So uh, I guess pick a bone with God if you don't like these <laughs> concepts. Sean, here's, here's the, the most, one of the high level perspectives on this. And that is that God wants men and women to dwell together in unity he wants brethren to dwell in unity unity it's he maybe even Ephesians. harmony would be a better word because <laughs> yeah, people harmony. perceive unity to be like oh this person agrees and this person agrees no the whole point of harmony in a corporate structure for example <clears throat> is that there's an executive there's a leader and there's a follower you can't have harmony without leaders and followers you can't have everyone be a leader yeah. then there's no harmony, right? Mm -hmm. So you have unity through harmony, but people think unity means everyone agrees. You know, we're going to, I think we're going to get into this more as we get go through um, this volume here on Mask and Christianity about hierarchy. This is a, a related debate. There are Christians that think that um, hierarchy is a man-made thing. And uh, then there's uh, another side that, uh, no, it's actually in the created order, in the angelic order. And you don't, if you don't have hierarchy, you don't have any basis for submission. If everybody, everybody is equal, uh, before, created before God, is, is we're equal as, as sinners, we're equal before the law of God. Uh, but then there's the great inequality of your role and station in life that, uh, by gender, actually. Yeah, that, that's, that's the hot button. So... Um, and there uh, are other hierarchies, right? <clears throat> I mean, uh, according to your your moral mm -hmm. um, level, according to your intellectual ability, there are all kinds of th ways that the hierarchy. There, there's a world hierarchy. There's a spiritual hierarchy, and, and it's not just by gender. There, there are many different uh, you know ways that hierarchy unfolds. But to, to act like we can all be at the same level is, is preposterous. Yes. And, and I just want to underscore that unity is commanded in the scriptures. Uh, and it's, so it's in Ephesians 4, 3 that uh, we're commanded as Christians. Now I'm talking, hopefully I'm talking to Christians. All right. So we want to struggle with this, you know, to your point about, whoa, we've got women in all kinds of places. And then we have men who maybe they shouldn't be in certain places. They need to be out there taking dominion, providing, protecting 
governing, okay? But um, we are commanded to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. See, it's the unity of the Spirit that is required of us. And because that is a requirement of the Lord Jesus Christ on his people, the devil cannot stand it if we're going to have spiritual unity. So to your point, Sean, it doesn't mean you're agreeing on everything. That is totally correct. It means your attitude and your honoring to the one who you must render, uh, you know, depending on, on the context. You know, a lot of this, we're talking about the husband and wife relationship, and that really is where it begins. Okay, so the unity that must have you must have in the marriage relationship, the devil's going to try everything relentlessly to destroy that and he's been very effective at that and this is a conviction that i i have so granted uh there's a lot of one third of our our congress in dc is women somebody might make a case about why they should be there i believe we're in a time of judgment because of that okay and uh it says there is a breakdown in family government all right unity there you see uh, women are called to govern as much as men, but they're how they govern. Okay, uh, it's not been designed for them to be out there dealing with the ugly stuff that God built men for to deal with and and bear the brunt of the attacks out there. Women, it is really unsightly and undignified for women to want to subject themselves to. Uh, that kind of confrontation and if people um yeah again, a good article, example that the people have used barry are female police officers mm -hmm. and how much more often they shoot people by accident and so forth mm -hmm. because they they're built uh they're built in a different way mentally and physically uh and emotionally uh for things in the military for things in, in police and law enforcement. My three-year-old's got this truck, and he's running around the entire house, I'm and he's it. reverberating. <laughs> but I, I'm with you there, you know. And I think women are going to be a lot more happy if they're not dealing with that ugliness, and they can deal with the jurisdiction that's more appropriate for their their uh, capabilities. Here's here's here here's how we can um, can cap this off to encourage both men and women, but um, you know. It's, it's, both, both, of course, but I, I'm, I'm thinking maybe especially women right now, we're talking about feminism, which is the wrong idea of womanhood, all right? And through this uh, first wave of feminism that came into America for from the 1830s to 1920s, you have women who are contentious about manly drinks, they're contentious against restitution, and they're contentious against marital oneness. All right, rather than just... <clears throat> Does divorce Intention. play into the marital oneness? Is that another thing that we didn't touch on? What's that? Divorce. I mean, aren't, haven't the rules changed about that? No fault divorces. It's right. so easy yes. for, for women. To, and it's always the women, isn't it? Statistically, uh, yeah. I don't know what it is exactly, but it's by a long shot women who are initiating divorce. Yes. And there have been, I've done a little bit of reading about that, that, uh, you know, the the women's suffrage movement is part and parcel of what has led up to the no-fault divorce, the, uh, that women uh, want to act independently of their husbands. And that's wrong. They, they should act in harmony, in unity with their husbands, not independent. Why did you get married? You're to be, you're, you're no longer, no, you, you're not understanding what marriage is about, right? It's not a thing you can get in. It's not like you join a club and then you, you know, expire your membership. It's not that. It's a covenant. It's 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 till you death do us part. It should. I'm sure that was part of the vows. Okay, and so uh, you need a covenant to keep it together when things get tough and ugly. All right, and uh, <clears throat> so that's something to just you know get sober minded about, get convicted about, and if there where there is divorce because there is a lot of divorce for a lot of folks um god's goodness is there his redemption upon repentance you know when you repent for your contribution god can go to work 
and bring restitution. Okay. Uh, well, actually, re- re- actually, actually, the word reconciliation. See, it's rare to find people who want to actually believe for reconciliation of their divorce marriage, but that can happen. And I know of one in particular where uh, there was a married couple that got remarried. Glory to God. So um, women and men can believe for that. All right. So, But what I want to just cap this uh, session off with, Sean, for today is that rather than being contentious, that's because that's the devil's work. Women can govern by persuasion. Okay. And that's about you governing yourself. And that's called self-government. That's what this program is about. Self-government is the answer to everything, every problem, because self-government is the government of Christ in you and in you for the wife, for the, the woman, he does give you the character of Christ to be persuasive. Yeah. Can you can you just quote persuasive. the scripture about how women persuade through their conduct? Oh, yeah. You mean in First Peter 3, without words? That? Yeah. <laughs> See, that's where, um, yeah. See, that passage there is saying even without a word. See, you can't be contentious with your husband. The wife has the authority to govern herself in meekness, and that is about her conduct. It's First Peter chapter one. I'm sorry, First Peter chapter three, verses one through six, and then verse seven does uh, reference the man to dwell with his wife properly. But verses one through six, the wife without a word. She may, doesn't say it's a guarantee, but she may win over the husband if she thinks he's disobeying God, but not with her words. Uh, Doesn't mean she can't communicate with him, but she has to be very careful that she's not correcting him and she's not being contentious and, and creating an attitude and an atmosphere in the home that is thick with like heaviness. And I, I know what I'm talking about, as uh, I think every man does know, <laughs> is we can't have heaviness in our homes. You know, we have to have... Yeah, there there can be home. a silent wife who's also in rebellion. <laughs> so, that, so I know what That's you're true. talking about. Yes. Uh, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is a concept that seems foreign to, to people. And modern American culture is so much more of a... Uh, you know, you go out and you do stuff and you make stuff happen and you do a speech and you persuade someone and and all of that stuff. Meekness is not a part of our culture, Uh, but this is Christ's nature, this meekness. And it's actually very persuasive, especially to righteous people. Uh, You know, when, when one person's kind of proving through their conduct that they're more moral, that they're more sport, spiritually in line, then it makes it automatically makes that righteous person convicted and want to make things right, want to also be meek, want to re- reconcile. Uh, so it can be really, really uh, effective, uh, but it's not a tool used very often for reconciliation. That's right. I Yes, for those women who, who feel compelled to lead Go ahead and do it, but do it the way God has prescribed, and that is govern yourself, and that's called personal leadership. Lead yourself no further than what God has outlined in His revealed law, and just and and where you all you I mean to the great starting place is Ephesians chapter five, Titus chapter two. And then the other passage I mentioned just now, 1 Peter chapter 3. There's three passages there, Ephesians, Titus, and 1 Peter 3. There's enough material there. Uh, there's material there for the husband as well. But for the wife, master those passages, internalize them. Uh, you will be governing yourself, and that's that's personal leadership, is to govern yourself under the what Christ commands, the Christian wife. Okay. Amen, Barry. Thank you for mentoring us and guiding us and educating us in the scriptures and how to be better husbands, be better wives, be better fathers and mothers, and be better Americans. 
So I uh, really appreciate everything you've shared. Make sure you go to Barry's website, libertyisthelaw.us. You can get all kinds of free resources, including a movie list. Uh, so you can also contact Barry, get a, get a free discovery call uh, so that you can, can see how Barry and his whole family, because they're, they're, really, they're a package. So they have all kinds of skills uh, that they can use to help your family, whatever it might be. So just do the discovery call and see, see what problems you have and how they can be solved through biblical um, strategies. And also go to seanmorganreport.com, sign up for my newsletter. You're going to get Sunday scriptures delivered to your inbox every Sunday. And also, of course, I have my uh, citizen journalism I do, fighting communism, standing up for uh, what the American Constitution is all about. God bless all you patriots. We'll see you next Sunday. And thanks for watching. Thank you for being a part of our Christian self-government ministry by supporting our sponsor. A way to support the channel and be able to get a really great experience of waking up every single day with the Great Awakening Gourmet Coffee. So this is the website, thegreatawakeningcoffee.com. You go here, you click on Get Started, and, uh, and then it takes you to the next step. You choose whether you're going to buy the coffee for your home or your office. So we'll just click Home for now. And the website will load here. And by the way, this company is totally Patriots owned. So that's what I really like about this company. You can choose what kind of coffee you want, ground, whole, or the K-cup. So we'll just choose ground. It's the easiest. That's the way I, I buy it. And then you can pick the kind that you like. I prefer the, uh, the Washington blend, South America blend. Click on that. You put in the size that you want, one pound or two pound. You can subscribe so that it sends the same amount of coffee at the same time every month. And then click subscribe and save. Then click on view cart. Make sure you put in the coupon code QFAQ to get a discount. And then proceed to checkout, and you know how to handle the rest with your credit card. It's that simple. Uh, you know what's going on right now with the corporate coffee is they're donating a bunch of millions of dollars to Black Lives Matter. So ditch the corporate coffee. Check out thegreatawakeningcoffee.com. Support the Patriots. Support this channel. Thank you so much for your support. God bless.